Okay. Good evening, everybody. We're live again. Live, live this time. Hello. All right. So welcome to Talk With History. I'm your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. On this podcast, we give you insights into our history-inspired travels, YouTube channel journey, and examine history through deeper conversations with the curious, the explorers, and the history lovers out there. Now, this week, I want to tell folks about the our hashtag historic newsletter. We've, we've actually seen some solid growth recently, and we're excited this is starting to gain some traction because there's a lot of history we can share through the newsletter that might not ever make it to the podcast or a video. So if you're curious to check out that newsletter, it's free. It doesn't cost a single thing. But it's not hashtag historic anymore. So that's the name of the newsletter, but the website is much easier to remember. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is go to historynewsletter.com and you can sign up for free so that's historynewsletter.com historynewsletter.com check it out it's a lot of fun you can feel free to, to email us back um, when you get the kind of welcome aboard initial email mm -hmm. and actually with that i want to call out someone who's been listening both to the podcast and um, subscribing to the newsletter it's a monthly newsletter and she actually responded to one of our, our newsletter uh, posts recently her name is tina so she said, hello, I've been listening to your podcast for a bit now. Currently, I'm sitting drinking coffee and reading You Never Forget Your First. It's a book about George uh, G.W. Anyway, it got me thinking. The book references that many of Washington's letters were never found or saved. My question is, when did preserving presidential pa papers become an official act. So I know, Jen, you actually already knew something a little bit about this. So I knew, I had worked at the James Garfield house. I had done an internship there and basically inventoried all of their, not artifacts, but all of their artifact holding uh, material. Everything that it encloses the artifacts, I inventoried all of that for the National Park Service. The James Garfield House in Mentor, Ohio, is considered the first presidential library because his wife, um, Lucretia, after he's assassinated, thought people might want to read his paper someday. People might want to read what he wrote. People might want to read his letters, his journal. So I'm going to save everything. Now, that wasn't official. She did it because she just had some forethought. Um who wrote, who said this again? This was Tina. So Tina, George Washington's papers were destroyed. <laughs> so, and not purposely. So what happened with George Washington is before, and I'll get to the date, it's really in the 1970s, before the 1970s, presidential papers and vice presidential papers belonged to the person. Yeah. Belonged to that person, the president or vice president. And they could take them home and they can disseminate them how they decided. And with George Washington, he had planned to build like a library, like a vault with his papers. But fortunately, he died before he could do that. And he gives his um, his aide, you know, get my papers in order, get my accounts in order. Those are like his dying words on his deathbed, but never like save my papers. Now his papers were given to some people at the time who wanted to write a Washington biography and they kept them and used them for a biography, but then they just kind of like stored them. And there is one letter that said I had Washington's papers, but they've become so damp and overcome by rats. Wow. So you can imagine some George Washington's papers were just destroyed from someone just being careless and storing his papers and not realizing that they would be of importance. Now you do get Martha Washington destroyed a lot of letters. Uh, Arthur uh, Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln destroys his father's letters. Arthur's son will destroy his letters. Uh, Harding's wife destroys his letters. She says, cause she doesn't want anything uh, embarrassing remembered about him. I will say a lot of people destroyed letters at this time, and I talk about this a lot with Jane Austen and her sister destroying her letters, is because correspondence is very personal. So is, is, was it like kind of like pillow talk type stuff? It's not really pillow talk. It's more like health talk. Oh. Because, okay. yeah. you know, it's the time where people are getting sick pretty consistently. So how often are you going to the bathroom? Yeah, things What's like that. What's it okay. like? Um, what's its consistency? Those are, and it's very personal. 
and you know people like like phlegm kind of type because sure. sickness is a way of life then yeah and, and overcoming sickness is a way of life and people don't want those kind of personal affairs yeah to be brought into the public. So when so when did when did like people really start saving more intentionally or did it start with with Garfield and became like official policy and law later? It really starts with Garfield in 1939 our FDR donates his papers and books for an official library. Uh -huh. And that's when the official library system presidential system really starts. But Presidents can still destroy their papers. Yeah. So if you don't like something you wrote or someone someone wrote or a, a correspondence that was a little, it. you could just burn it. But it's not really, and this is really interesting, it's not until the Presidential Records Act of 1978 that those official records of every president and vice president are the property of the United States of America. You can no longer destroy them. And this was brought on because Nixon sought right. to destroy his records relating to... Uh, his indiscretion sure and uh and everything he had about resigning in 1974 so right. he tried to destroy all of that um the official records of it and to stop the national archives to stop him uh passed this act it really uh, fell under the reagan administration all of his papers were now official records of the united states government they did go back and retroactively get nixon's papers but this is when it now becomes an issue. And even today, right, we're getting into like President Trump's papers and Vice President Pence's papers and President Biden's papers. People are taking these things home. People are putting them in storage and really they don't belong to them personally. Yeah. And that, that goes for everybody who's a president or a vice president. They all get to go to the National Archives and the archive can decide. Okay. Um, what is important or not important? Yeah, no, and, and and I just really appreciated Tina kind of su submitting the question. That was a great question. So thank you so much, Tina. For for anybody else that subscribes to the hashtag Historic Newsletter at the um, at HistoryNewsletter dot com, um, we have have another monthly one coming up here in the next couple of weeks. I've got some articles I'm putting together. Um, so there should be interesting stuff. So if you're ever curious, you know, we've got podcast recommendations, video recommendations, mm -hmm. things like that. But Tina, that was a great question. Great question. Thank you so much. If you find one of those letters from Washington or Lincoln, I mean, I think they still are around. People could be hiding them in their walls or in old books. Yeah, it's possible. Because they're not official. They weren't saved by the archives. Yeah. So they're still out there. Yeah. Now on to kind of our main topic. Um, so we're obviously we're talking about the video. Yes. So, so so video that posted yesterday was about Rose Green Howe. She's a Confederate spy during the during the Civil War. During so, the Civil War. So tell us a little bit about the background of, of Rose Green Howe. Okay, so we have Rose O'Neill Green Howe. And O'Neill is important because this is kind of her background and to learn more about her. She is born, they, I'm not sure, 1813, 1814, in a small rural farm in Maryland. It's a tobacco farm. And her family uh, is a, they, they produce tobacco. They have, they have enslaved people who work the tobacco farm. So, of course, they're a proponent of enslavement. And then when she's about 13, 14 years old, her father is murdered. And when he's murdered, he leaves behind a lot of debt. And the children have to be disseminated to members of the family because his her her mother the the widow can't take care of all these children and rose o'neill goes to an aunt in washington dc at 13 14 years old her aunt runs a boarding house in washington dc which is a very common thing mary surratt is running a boarding house in washington dc so they have these boarding houses at the time, it's a, it's it's kind of what women did if they were widowed or single. It was a very um, acceptable job for women at that at that age and level. And because a lot of people are in and out of D.C. having government meetings or official meetings, a boarding house is a great business because people aren't really buying property there. Well, and I thought it was interesting because we were trying to we were trying to find out when we were putting the video together mm -hmm. exactly where this boarding house mm -hmm. might have been 
or you know later on the like some places got turned into prisons or in the civil war and mm-hmm. this that and the other so we were trying to kind of search out where these things were but we found out there was like 80 different boarding houses in the washington dc area and you know, i mean if you know back then like dc is still small even even for that that time sure period. so when you think about it people who were representing government or in the government didn't do what they do today. They right. don't have two houses. Right. They don't have a house where you live and a house in DC. They had a house where they lived and they came to DC to do their job, to do their meetings, and they stayed at a boarding house. So the boarding houses were very common and they were, or, or hotels. The Willard Hotel is a big hotel in DC that is known for famous people staying there. And so that's kind of what people did. They didn't really own homes in DC. And so her, so Rose O'Neill goes to live in this boarding house and it's a congressional boarding house. So it's, it's a, it's clientele is government higher, higher end people. Yeah. And, and I think too, right. So if Rose was the daughter of, you know, her father before he got, he got mm-hmm. murdered, right. Was a property owner. So sure. she was probably decently educated, decently educated, right. So lower she, class, lo- but not the lowest class. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, um, and if anybody watches, I'll kind of throw this out in advance. If, if it's anybody's ever seen Comedy Central, Drunk, <laughs> Drunk History, they actually do an episode on that. This was Rose Greenhow that they do an episode on, right? No. Or was that was that someone else? They did an episode on <laughs> James Calendar. <laughs> no, it wasn't James Calendar. It was a different one. I'm, I'm pretty sure. They, oh, they, they the, I didn't see it. I don't know I, if they, they did. They, they do on her because they, they, they talk about like how she basically either seduced or was with you know these different yes the history channel does a pretty good job of that but But, yes okay so comedy central so sorry so uh so this is how she gets first introduced to this new level of society right and so it's in her aunt's boarding house that she's starting to meet congressional people and this is how she meets dr greenhow and dr greenhow is a He's a, a federal librarian. He has a medical degree. He has a law degree. And they hit it off and they start dating. And and she was actually, we didn't, this didn't make it into the video, but she was actually introduced to him, met him mm-hmm. through the, the social circles, through, um, what's her face? Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison. Yes. So, so she's, she's yes. moving in those circles. Right. And uh, she's moving in the Madison circle, uh, former president. Madison uh, Circle. Dolly is, of course, older at the time. So she meets Dr. Greenhow. Right. And when you kind of think about it, Greenhow's marrying kind of below his status, mm-hmm. but he must. But her, if I remember right, now Historical USA was with us on this video. Mm-hmm. But I, if it was either you or her that said that um, Rose's sister actually married like a congressman or, or, or someone related to like you know, some well known politician yes, type. Yes, yes. And so. She was, the doctor was marrying below, but he was also marrying the sister of someone who just got married to someone a little bit more famous. Yes. So there's that, that balance there. That's balances. They're, they're moving up. You could say that yeah. they're, uh, you know, they're, they're. And then that's how families did it back then. Sure. Right. You know, they like, Hey, I'm going to educate my daughter mm-hmm. as best as I can. I'm going to send her somewhere. And if she gets in high society circles and start mar- starts marrying up. Like that's how families raise their status. Absolutely, and there were people who definitely sought that out. Yeah, and that so she marries Doctor Greenhow. They have, I think it's five. They have like four children. He goes out west. She goes out west with him. Uh, before she has her fourth child, she comes back to D.C. to have her fourth child. He stays behind, and he actually dies. Uh, he falls off like an elevated sidewalk. And is killed. This was in D.C. or out no, west? No, out west. Okay. Like so she, California west? Uh, California west. Oh, wow. And so she becomes a widow with a pension and moving in these high echelon political circles. And this is about the onset of the Civil War. Uh, we got Buchanan. We got Davis. We got people who are having a lot of. And she's still very southern. And she's very, very, t- very, very tied, southern. Tied to very, she believes in her southern, um, you know, allegiances. Yep. So, when the Civil War does break out, she is already embedded. Right. And she doesn't leave D.C. because she's only her. When she moves back to have her child. And her husband stays out west. She buys that boarding house four blocks to the north of D.C. Okay, so she didn't take over the one from her aunt. She no, gets a new one. she gets her own. Okay. 
And that home is now where the Hayes Adams Hotel is. Right. But if you see our video, it's such a prominent spot in Washington, D.C. It's like you could literally, you know, well, maybe uh, Patrick Mahomes could throw a football from that <laughs> hotel to the White House. I know. And if you can imagine 1860 without Lafayette Square, without the White House lawn, without yeah. the gate, you could walk from there in like 10 minutes. It's not even 10 minutes. Five minutes, it's yeah. It's literally a stone's throw. So that's one of I the things. I mean, you could things. see, you could say, you could yep. you could say, I want to see you walk to the White House and wave to me when you get to the porch so I know you made it. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's literally as a parent, you could do that. You're like, hey, go, go take this to the president. I made him some cookies. Yeah, so that's how close she is to the White House. So again, people who are meeting Lincoln and having discussions and you got Seward's house is right uh, beside Lafayette Square. So like you a have block away. like a block away. Yeah, he's Secretary of State. So you have all of these people in close proximity. So when war breaks out and she's already running in these circles, she's able to start to gather information and yeah. gather secrets. And, and Lisa had mentioned that she was actually kind of a big fan and like almost on the borderline, like, hey, like he's just like almost worshipped him, right, to, to a point. Of Jefferson Davis. Oh yeah, she loved Jefferson Davis. So, and and Lisa had said um, that in in her research that it was she started some of this kind of spy or getting information. Right, they probably didn't call it spying right mm -hmm. up front. Hey, go spy for me. It's like, hey, how many troops do they have? Do they talk about that in your in your boarding house? Yeah, and at the behest of Jefferson Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis had asked her to do it, and yeah. she felt very loyal to him. She loved him. Yeah. I mean, she really had like like when she and I'll talk about when she goes to the prison, um, he, she is iconic to her yeah. and she believes in him and she believes in, like I said, the Southern, um, allegiance and what they're fighting for and what they believe in and state's rights. She kind of, she's very bought in to that. So having the boarding house and having these single men or uh, unsingle men, but men of higher status come visit her, She's able to get information. And one of those men is, of course, General Irving McDowell. He's in charge of the the Union Army in the beginning of the Civil War. Yep. And he comes and visits her. And uh, she asks very <sighs> undermined questions. Like, I see you're getting troops ready. How many troops should I pray for? Should I pray for 3,000 troops? And, of course, he wants to boast. Yep. So he's like, no, more like 30,000 troops. And she's like, oh. And then she's able to get that information back to Beauregard, who is going to be in charge of the Confederate army on the other side. It's going to be 30,000 troops. They're thinking of a place south of Manassas. And in the July time frame, yeah. they're going to march the troops. They think it's going to be a quick and easy, decisive battle. Uh, the railroad line is there, and that's why they're going to go there. And so he's able to get enough Confederates there to meet that level of Union troops, 30,000, to put up a good defense, to put up a good fight, to actually push them back. And it's enough to scare them that it's not going to be easy. Right. And, it, it, and that's why she's so regarded. Um, she, she, she gets a lot of credit. Beauregard gives her credit. She gets a lot of credit. I mean, th this is probably her biggest claim to fame, yeah. First Battle of Bull Run, but she gets a lot of credit for this because of all the information she was able to get to Beauregard and he was able to use it. And then the Confederates were able to put up a good defense. And this really is the moment when Lincoln realizes that could be a quick war. He also realizes that McDowell is an incompetent leader. So you're going to get a lot of this and you're going to get a lot of stuff that comes out of this battle. Uh, next week will be bull run. We'll talk about the things that come out of this, but you're going to get the union very much falling back on reputation. Yeah. They're going to lose a lot of reputation and you're going to get the South really exploding their reputation. And you're going to get some famous names and monikers that are going to come out of the first battle of bull run. So you're going to see the morale kind of yep. switch it's a little. It's kind of like a big rally for, for the South. Big rally for the South, and it, it's a big hardship for the Union. And, and one of the things that, um, one of the reasons that we we did this video this month, right, was obviously Women's History Month, but also it ties into our video from last week, which was about a Union mm -hmm. Civil War spy, but also another female. Yes. And so we talk a little bit about in this video how no one really suspected Rose Greenhow because she was a woman. Because she's a woman. And yeah. And that, so, so the same way that the union female spy is operating under this pretense that women 
are not at the level to be privy to this information. They don't understand this information. It's just too much for them to comprehend war. And they so they can kind of slide under the radar. Same thing. Rose Greenhouse using the same thing to her advantage. I'm a Southern Belle. Yeah. Uh, all I care about is uh, entertaining. I'm not interested in your war talk, but I'll, I'll listen to it because that's what you seem to want to talk about. When really, that's all she really wants to talk about. But yep. she'll pretend like it's not. Um, and I wanted to do women focus because of Women's History Month. And I wanted to do a union spy who was pivotal in the Battle of the Ironclads and then a Confederate spy who's pivotal in the first Battle of Bull Run. And they both happen to be women. Yeah, we actually have... Is it next week's video? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be Bull Run? Yeah, it'll be Bull yeah, Run. So we, so we go to Bull Run, right? And so uh, do that kind of through the through the lens of, mm -hmm. of, of, the, women. of the women that, that mm -hmm. serve there, which is, I think, different. Um, but again, uh, one of the things I just, uh, it just kind of was so interesting to me that last week's video and this week's video, it doesn't matter what side of the union, what side of the war you were on, whether you were black or white, because you were a woman, people just didn't assume that you weren't doing anything. Yeah, they, not, they just didn't, didn't assume you were at that level of, of yeah, intelligence it, or, or importance yes like right? you were good enough to wash dishes you were definitely good enough to mend wounds right uh good enough to stitch clothes and but you're not good enough to know anything about strategic you know maneuvers and what you know military uh tactics right like that's now, not now there now there was one person yeah, <laughs> that suspect that suspected was Greenhow, and this name's actually pretty well known yes yeah, so what happens is People are like, he, he knew, Beauregard knew, yeah. and the union realizes that he knew. And so it's actually S S Seward, uh, Seward who first kind of suspects because he sees so many people. Because again, he could probably see her porch from his porch. Sure. He's just looking across He's the way. He's probably looking across the way. And look at all the union it's guys. Like, and so and so just went in there, and, and so and so. And she just loves Jefferson Davis. Yeah. You know, he probably, and so he hires Pinkerton. Yeah. The, like the, the, the Alan Pinkerton. Uh, the, uh, the Alan Pinkerton of the, the Pinkerton defective. Uh, d detective agency because they're actually working at the time for president lincoln yeah and they're actually working intel for president lincoln so he hires and he goes why don't you watch her house uh so in august so so first battle bull run happens in july in august pinkerton's hired to look at rose greenhouse house again four blocks from the white house and he's literally just like peeking in the window <laughs> he's being, like he's Standing on someone's shoulders, looking in the windows. Like, really, like, if you're walking by and you're like, look at them, that yeah. guy on his like shoulders, <laughs> looking, and he sees her entertaining Union soldiers. He sees her pulling out maps with Union soldiers, and they're pointing at things. And you see her, again, she's very good at pretending like she doesn't care. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm just entertaining you and listening to what you have to say. But really, that's all she cares about because that's those are the things she will bring is ciphered maps and ciphered uh, intelligence. But Pinkerton sees that and he knows. And I say that Pinkerton is really like the true feminist because he believes yeah. that Ro Ro Green Rose Greenhouse is capable of this. Right. Like he's giving her a lot of agency that that other men at the time probably would not or are not. Basically nobody else yes. except Seward who had gotten into some arguments with her in the past and can like <laughs> live across the street from her essentially. Yeah. Um, and so Pinkerton is giving her a lot of credit, which is totally due because she did it. And so he tries to accost her on the street um, right after this happens. And again, you're having this scenario of a Southern elite woman being accosted on the street by a, a working class gentleman. So Pink Pinkton gets arrested yeah. <laughs> because you, people are going like, why are you harassing this woman? Why are you looking in her window? Yeah, and why are you on the street? So he gets arrested, taken to prison. And when he's questioned, he says, I'm here for a bigger cause. I'm here for a bigger purpose. And so then he's allowed to go to Rose Greenhouse home. And when he searches her home, he finds the ciphers oh, yeah. and the maps. And she gets arrested. And she gets arrested. And she's put on house arrest at first in her home. But she doesn't stop spying. Yeah, she keeps getting information. <laughs> this is what I thought was so interesting for her is like she believes in her side of the cause so deeply that she continues to get information through her network. She had built up like a, a network, a network of, of 48 40, women 40 to 50 women. And two men. Yeah. And she uses like colored curtains and she uses colored handkerchiefs. And candles in the windows. And candles in the windows. Yeah. And they, they can't stop her. So they're like, okay, we're going to put you in prison. And she's like, okay, do it. And so 
She's taken to the old Capitol prison uh, in January of 1862. So things are moving relatively quickly when you think about it. Um, the old Capitol prison is located directly behind the U.S. Capitol. It's where the United States Supreme Court stands today. Right. But this was a this was a prison in D.C. that used to hold congr congressional hearings and meetings. And Rose Greenhow, when she went there, it, it, she she writes this whole biography of herself after. And I'll tell you when she writes this. So you get a lot of this first. Um, source account of what happened from her she sits in the prison and all she can think about is jefferson davis giving a talk in one of the rooms and she hopes to see that room again because that talk was so inspiring for her about him and, and so she can't get even get jefferson davis off the mind in prison now this prison is going to hold uh confederate officers it's going to execute confederate conspirators uh, this is where the lincoln conspirators will eventually be held before they are executed. So this prison is a pretty renowned uh, prison in Washington, D.C. And she's held there from January of 1862 to May of 1862, so about four months, because she still doesn't stop. Yeah, she's, she's still getting messages out. She's she still uses using... her daughter. Like, she's put in prison with her eight-year-old daughter, and she uses her daughter to get messages to out. messages, yeah. Her daughter's allowed to play in the, the middle of the, the grassy field, you know, a, to get some exercise and her daughter will pass messages to people because sympathizers. And uh, so eventually they, they're not going to execute her. They don't know what to do with her. This is the time why I say the, the federal government has not executed a woman in history, uh, an American white woman in history yet. So they prison exchange her. So in May of 1862, she's exchanged for uh, some Union prisoners. She's exchanged to the South. She's told, do not come back. Stay on the Confederate side. So she's, she's exchanged down to Richmond, Virginia. And one of the first things she does <laughs> is meet with Jefferson Davis. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, I, you think about it like uh, sh this, she was like at the point of brainwashed. Yeah. You know? Like to, her loyalty was just so intense. And I mean, we've been to Davis's house, the Confederate White House yeah. in Richmond. She probably met him there. She probably. probably... And, the, and honestly, that's probably when she got most of her just like in person recognition. Yes. Yeah, she's, she was right? very she, revered. She's a heroine. She's of, a heroine. Of, of, of the South. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually, Eventually, she she runs off to so eventually she overseas. goes to to Europe. Okay, and she goes to Europe to raise awareness for the Southern cause, and this is where she's going to write her autobiography. Okay. This is where she's going to write my first hand account of how terrible the North is and what they did to me. And but she's giving you basically how she spied and what she did. So it's very you know that's how we we know kind of the stuff she got across and how she did it. Um, and she raises, she brings her daughter over with her. She raises a lot of funds. She raises $2,000 in gold. And she comes back um, in August of 1864. She comes back and she's on the HMS Condor, which is a, a British blockade runner. So a fast ship when you think about it. And she has like $2,000 in gold sewn into her dress to kind of hide the gold, get it back to the South. And the... It's about April fir October 1st, the Condor is coming into Wilmington, North Carolina, and it gets grounded. It runs aground. The captain thinks he sees Union ships, so he tries to, you know, be covert, and he, he runs aground. And so Rose is like, well, if they're, if they're coming, I, I want to get off the ship. Can I get a rowboat? And so she gets on a rowboat, and because she's carrying all this gold, and, you know, it's, yep. it makes it... Um, too heavy. Too she heavy. And the ship sinks and she's pulled down with it uh, because of the gold. And she drowns. Uh, her body is found four days later. And then she is given a full military decorated funeral That's wild. in Wilmington, North Carolina. I mean, they drape the Confederate flag across her coffin. It is full regala. And um, you can see her grave today. And it still kind of has like a... a a plaque there and it's decorated her daughter will stay in france um she didn't bring her daughter with her she didn't want to bring her daughter back in the middle of a war but uh that is kind of her legacy she's kind of lived on in the south as this m martyr 
this heroine, this believer of a cause. Um, again, her big success was Bull Run. She never really gets any secrets. She really doesn't get um, the 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 backing, the financial backing that she was hoping to get from the from England. But people remember her for Bull Run. Yeah, no, it was it was it was quite an interesting story. Um, and again, another fun one for us to explore. One because we just got to walk around Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. DC for the day because it's a huge walk. It's from the Capitol. Yeah. To the Supreme Court. Yeah, it was a hike. Mm-hmm. And we got to hang out with Lisa, which yes, was really fun. that was really fun. So cool. uh, if you guys are curious, go check her channel out at Historical USA. Um, but uh, th- that was that was a blast. So, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, bravery, it comes in all shapes and sizes. And during the Civil War, many didn't think that bravery also came in all genders, Rose Greenhow may have been fighting for the wrong side of the Civil War, but no one will question that she had a direct impact on various aspects of the war. Just look at what happened at Manassas. Yes, it took Alan Pinkerton himself giving her credit to be suspicious enough to investigate this Civil War Confederate spy, someone who is now viewed as a traitor to the North, but a heroine to the South. So thank you for listening to the Talk With History podcast, and please reach out to us at our website, talkwithhistory.com. But more importantly, if you know someone that might enjoy this podcast, please share it with them, especially if you think today's topic would interest a friend. We rely on you, our community, to grow, and we appreciate you all every day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thanks for everybody in the, in the chat and the live stream. Um, obviously, this stuff I cut off on the podcast, so we really appreciate you guys kind of joining us and asking some questions. Super appreciate you guys. Yeah, and Abel, that was an interesting point of, that you brought up about uh, people before the Civil War would just walk up to the White House without an appointment. Mm-hmm. I, that's, you know, I we I think we've all kind of seen that, so I, yeah. I think that's interesting, but we, and, we, we love having you guys on. Yes. It's a lot of fun. So th- that's interesting, Abel. Um, I was reading about the word lobbyist, Right. And people say it came about with Grant and maybe after Grant too, a little bit with uh, Garfield, people who would wait in the lobby of the, um, of the white house, of the white house to speak to the president. Sure. And people also, if they were on the same political side, felt like they should get favors or they should get a political appointments. And so they would wait to talk to the president. Yeah. And you get a lot of that. That's why secret service was, I mean, it wasn't even implemented for a long time, but Garfield is accosted in the in the train station, and that's when he's shot and killed. Um, I mean, he lingers, but he eventually dies. But uh, it's because people had so much access yeah. to the president and to the house and to the surroundings. It was hard to keep someone safe, but there also was like a different level of decorum there. Sure. Then when you did, you didn't really feel like you, in society and your status right. to bother the president. Yeah. And people adhere to that a little bit more. I think. Yeah, yeah. Back then, well, it's a smaller population, yeah. like you said, it was a different era. Yeah. Um, yes, Abel. Uh, only eleven and a half million subs to go. I I feel like the the History Channel is pulling away, but we're we're, we're trying to keep up. We're trying, we're trying to, keep, to up. keep up. Tell um, your friends about the podcast <laughs> and the and the newsletter. We try to put stuff in the newsletter that's interesting. Interesting historical content yeah. could be about artifacts or uh, research. Um, I, there was a pretty good, interesting bit of research that just came out of Williamsburg. We'll probably be putting that in. Yeah, I'm going to put in, um, there's a like a museum that you said that's being built underneath the Lincoln Memorial mm-hmm. or something like yes, that. Yes, there's a new so museum. So I'm going to put an article in about that. So we try to share some stuff like that. So if you guys are curious, check it out. Right Again, it's one of those easy things to, to look mm-hmm. up, historynewsletter.com. Um, and it's actually been growing. Uh, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised by that. So hopefully we can kind of get some more more fun stuff in there. But but thank you again, everybody, for for joining us on the live stream. We really do appreciate this, and yes. we, we love having you guys on. Um, if you ever have questions for us that you want to an- you want us to kind of ask in the future, we can't an- we can't answer all of them. But feel please feel free to le- either drop a comment, yes, shoot us an email, visit the Talk with History website or something like that. Um, and, and then be on the lookout for our next videos of Bull Run. We're looking at Bull Run through the lens of women. Yeah. So the women at Bull Run, what were they doing? Who were they? That's right. And the impact that they're having on that, that battle. Should be should be next week's video. So you mm-hmm. guys get a little sneak peek there. So yes. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Everybody.